Hi, I'm Misty Jessie, and I welcome you to our Growing in the Word online series. In this series, we will be studying the book of Revelation. There will be a total of four separate online presentations. Unit 1, which will be presented today, includes an introduction to the text, followed by chapters 1 through 3. Something that you will find helpful in getting the most out of this presentation is your Bible. Before we begin, let's take a moment to clear our thoughts and open our minds and hearts to the Word of God as I begin our study with a word of prayer. As we open our Bibles, we also open our hearts. May these words of truth fall upon the very fabric of our lives. Father, we pray that these ancient scriptures would come alive within us to inspire, to heal, to cleanse, to teach, to restore, and to guide our hearts and minds. Lord, come weave your words of life in us. Amen. So understanding um, the book of Revelation, the best way to comprehend what we're looking at here is to look at it in terms of the context of the social and history of the time. So we're looking at the social, the historical, and the cultural world that's being addressed. Now, another um, thing that I want to make uh, clear is that Revelation doesn't um, applies to a very specific point in time by the author that's writing it. So taking it out of context, applying it to something that you know we're thinking of in terms of um, like a Left Behind series or some future rendition of things that are going to take place doesn't really do the book justice and what the author was writing to at that point in time. The audience are the seven churches that we know um, that the Apostle Paul established in Asia Minor, which today we look at um, as the area, the country that we know as Turkey. And um, the literature uh, is called apocalyptic, uh, and that term uh, revelation comes to mind because it's something that is slowly unveiling, explaining, revealing events that are taking place uh, and what to look for in terms of those events and their future outcomes. In terms of the author, God mediates, as we know, through human authors, and we see this throughout the writings of the Bible. And hence, it's important to understand the culture of that writer uh, and the history that they're living within. Early church writers, such as Justin Martin, uh, Martyr, and Arrhenius, um, think it is the Apostle John, the son of Zebedee, who actually wrote the book of Revelation. John saw um, his revelation taking place during the time of the close of the Emperor Domitian's reign, which would have been 18, uh, between the time period of 18 and 96, Common Era. That's the time frame of Domitian's birth and death, and his reign taking place later in that that. That, that frame of time. It's actually quite widely accepted by many scholars today that those persecutions that, were, uh, that took place under the Emperor Domitian is what led to the writing of the Book of Revelation. There are also other scholars, when you check into various commentaries and studies that have been done on the Book of Revelation, that feel that this isn't the same John as the author of the Gospel of John because of the significant difference in the writing styles and the dates of the writings. The writer himself tells us that he's writing from the island of Patmos, which is a Roman penal settlement. It's, and he's in prison as a result of his Christian preaching and his ministry. We have affirmation of this through the historian Eusebius, who writes that John was actually released from Patmos under the Emperor Nerva, and that uh, reign would have been, that period we're looking at is now between 96 and 98 Common Era. Before you is a map of the island of Patmos. It's a small Greek island that's located in the Aegean Sea. 
It's most famous for being the location of both the vision of and the writing of what we know as the Book of Revelation. It's a small island approximately 25 miles in circumference. Today it's under Greek control. Um, on uh, the island of Patmos, we have two main communities. One is the community of Kora, which is its capital city, and also Scala, which would have been its commercial port. There are several other um, small settlements located throughout the island. Uh, the current, um, the current, um, the majority of the church communities that are located there are of the Greek, of the, are of the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Some ruins from the island itself. So looking at the cultural background, what's taking place during this time um, that John is writing? Well, Christians are under persecution because they refuse to worship the emperor as lord. So they're under Roman authority, it's the Roman Empire, and worship is given to the emperor. There is something called the emperor cult. And so um, persecution isn't something that is consistent, nonstop, but you'll have pockets of it throughout the Roman Empire and also th through different reigns of um, the emperor uh, that happens to be in power at that point in time. So unfortunately for the Christians, um, they, st uh, they were being persecuted because they wouldn't um, show any kind of worship or allegiance to anyone besides the one true God similar to uh, the Jews from which they derive from, and we think of you know, monotheism, um, they weren't willing to, to give allegiance and, and look and claim that the emperor was also their lord. So they kept coming into, um, into conflict with the, with the Roman authorities, which many times would lead to persecution to the point of martyrdom. Extensive Christian persecution would later uh, escalate, um, and we would find a very strong uh, period of time when this would happen continuously during the 3rd century under the Emperor Decius. So what is that imperial cult? So once a year, some um, you would be required uh, as part of the imperial cults to show uh, and your respect and your allegiance to the Roman Empire um, as a citizen. And so you would have to give um, a certain amount of financial remuneration, but at the same time, you would also take a pinch of incense, and you would be standing before an image of the emperor, and you would say, claim that Caesar is Lord. So it was a test of loyalty to the state, and this was a yearly test, which would lead to, at different periods of time, to the martyrdom of Christians, because those that were strong in their faith and weren't willing uh, and weren't willing to deny uh, that only Jesus is Lord would suffer persecution up to the point of actual martyrdom. And during this time frame, as Christianity began to continue to grow, um, the Christians were finding themselves that they were no longer protected as being part of the Jewish sect. Judaism was the one religious group within the Roman Empire that didn't have to take part in this imperial cult. Because the Romans understood, after much rebellion and conflicts with the Jewish people, that they would refuse any allegiance to anything else than the one true God. And as long as the early Jewish Christian sect was part of Judaism, um, they were protected by that because up until then, the Romans considered them just another sect of Judaism. After the fall of Jerusalem in 70 Common uh, Era to the Romans um, and the falling of the temple, and then again after another rebellion that's known as the Bar Kokhba Rebellion that took place uh, between 132 and 135 Common Era, it became very clear that Christianity was a separate religion from Judaism. Judaism cut them off, would have nothing to do with them, and made it clear that this particular group was not a sect within Judaism. So now the Christians were a standalone, very small minority open to persecution from the Romans because they didn't have the same kind of protection and coverage that the Jewish people had uh, with their monotheistic faith and the acceptance of that among the Roman Empire. Some common, some terminology that we will find uh, within Revelation and what does that mean? And again, these are terms that would have been very 
common and the symbolism would have been understood by John's audience at that point in time in history. So the reference to wormwood. Wormwood is a plant with a very bitter taste, and the term is used symbolically as a term for a calamity and sorrow. Um, the plant is not poisonous, but it is just bitter. In the ancient world, the term abyss was uh, in reference to the subterranean home of the, of the demons, of the demon hordes. Ancients also believed that statues could speak. Sometimes the images that were found in different cultic and pagan shrines were actually hollowed out, and a, a priest of that particular cult would sometimes hide inside of them and speak for the god that it represented. And in terms of wine, in the ancient world, wine was traditionally uh, diluted, two parts water to one part wine, except, of course, when the aim was to become drunk. And wine, um, because of the alcohol in it, was one way of cleansing the water um, because, of course, they didn't have the scientific knowledge and technology that we have now in terms of um, the microbes and the different bacteria that water can harvest, so it was very easy to get sick. But by diluting it with wine, that alcohol helped clean the water to a certain extent, making it safer for them to drink. So before you is uh, an example of the wormwood plant. In um, our common phraseology of today, it's also known as silver mound, dusty miller, or the ghost plant. So um, if you're a horticulturist or you like the garden, you'd be familiar with the wormwood plant. As I mentioned earlier, um, the writing uh, of the book of Revelation took place while John was in exile on the island of Patmos, specifically because of his preaching activities. And he writes to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And these seven churches are the early church plannings of the Apostle Paul. So if you've ever had an opportunity to go on pilgrimage, many people go to the Holy Land. Some people also have the opportunity to do the seven footsteps of Paul. That would be a journey to Turkey to visit these different ancient churches. And so it's these early churches that Paul wrote to um, that would exchange letters because of their location also on a postal route. Um, and they're significant cities, so there's quite a bit of activity. And so this is the beginning and the basis as it grows in the expanding early Christian church. So they're significant in terms of the roles that they play in the growth of our faith. The date of a writing of the writing um, is approximately, we know, would have taken place after 70 um, Common Era, which is the fall of the Second Temple in Jerusalem. And the language that is used uh, in reference, um, you hear it frequently throughout the book of Revelation, is Babylon. So when John writes about Babylon, Babylon is the symbolic word for the Roman Empire. And the reason he's re referencing it is similar to what happened when the first Jerusalem temple fell. The first Jerusalem temple was actually destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar II, and um, he was a ruler of the Babylonian Empire, and that would have taken place at 587 before the Common Era. Um, and now we have, and of course, after the fall of that first temple, the Jewish people experienced a diaspora. They were spread throughout the empire. They had lost their holy place of worship, which was a temple in Jerusalem, and it was a very despondent time for them uh, in, in the lives of the Jewish people. So now we have the destruction again of the temple, which is the second temple, by another empire, which they consider evil, um, which is the Roman Empire. And so using that reference to Babylon would make sense again to the audience because they understand what the reference is. It's like what happened to them the first time. But again, that message of hope, because even though that they were dispersed and they fell to the Babylonian Empire, God didn't forget his people. He brought them back to Jerusalem, and there was the rebuilding of the second temple. So now here's John writing. The people have been dispersed. They've lost the second temple then, and due to the Roman Empire. So again, the reference to Babylon makes sense to them because it reminds them of what happened the first time the temple was destroyed, and God didn't forget them. 
so God won't forget them again. So there's always that underlying message of hope that runs throughout the book of Revelation. It was most likely written during the time of the Emperor Domitian, between 81 and 96, Common Era. Um, and the book of Revelation is considered to be one of the last books of the, that was written in the New Testament. It was actually accepted as sacred scripture in the latter half of the second century. So this is a map um, in reference to the Babylonian Empire. You can see how extensive it was at the time. Uh, and here we see that Jerusalem has been captured and is part of them. And when the people were captured, they were spread throughout the empire. Before you, you see the seven churches that, uh, that John will be addressing in the book of Revelation, starting with the first one at Ephesus. So John is writing from Patmos, so he can um, see clearly some of the different things. These are within his vision, his view, the coastline of what we know as Anatolia, um, common uh, modern-day Turkey. So what is the form of writing? The form of writing is called the genre. It's prophecy. So John describes his work as a prophecy. He records his visions and the voices that he hears. All of these are given to him through a divine angel. And it's explaining the events that have taken place and also the future events that they can expect. So revelations, apocalypse, is a Greek term. It generally involves the revealing of secrets of the universe. And we find the works of angels, and it's a place you see, you know, angels are involved, and there's rewards and punishments. And that term, again, comes from the Greek for unveiling. We find the revealing of also secrets in terms of political and historical events, and also the destiny of God's people. Sometimes the individual that's experiencing the vision is allowed to actually journey to these heavenly places. And oftentimes, the one that's experiencing the vision, the seer, is also commanded to seal up written accounts of visions of the future. So again, it's a very specific style of writing that would have been familiar to that ancient uh, community that, that John was writing to. Now, John's focus is on the Israelites and, he's, uh, and Judah. So he's accusing them of, not, of having failed to keep their covenant. And as a result, uh, they will suffer God's judgment along with the rest of the people. But despite this time of suffering, God is not going to abandon them. So remember, John is um, a Jewish Christian. Again, the message is always being brought to the Jewish people to repent um, to accept the Messiah, Jesus Christ, as the one long awaited for. And now we have the resurrected Christ. And also he's addressing that Gentile Christian community um, and challenging them, especially those who have become complacent or who are falling back or integrating pagan ways into the faith, the true faith of the early Christian church. Frequently um, common among Old Testament uh, Hebrew prophets is when they have a message, it's usually a call to conversion, to repent, to change your current lifestyle, to come back and be those people, the covenant people of God. And there's always that promise that God will be with them during difficult times. So it's not fortune-telling. It's very different from that. It's in, and throughout the Hebrew Bible, you'll see these repetitions of events throughout history where the people fall, from, fall away from God, and then they suffer severely they become slaves subjects to other empires and then they plead to god and he listens and hears them and he sends them a savior um, so that repetition is seen throughout the hebrew bible and so john is also pointing this out uh, and so there's a lot of references to events that have taken place in that hebrew bible through how these writings it's important to remember that biblical prophecy which is what makes it different from fortune telling, takes place in a very specific place in time, and it's very much tied to the writer's era. And he's addressing very specific circumstances in the world and the life around him. So what we find in the book of Revelation is a warning, a reminder 
this is your last chance. You don't know when God is going to come again in the form of Jesus, that second coming. So be prepared. Have your heart in the right place. If you haven't accepted Christ as your Messiah, it's time for that conversion moment. It's also a message of consolation to the seven churches because they're suffering. And if they're not suffering now, they can expect to suffer in the near future, a level of persecution. And the promise that God is sovereign. He is just. He is in control of everything that is taking place. And he will be just at the end. Uh, and those that are evil will receive their punishment. So this kind of apocalyptic uh, literature, revelation, is often um, tied into the wisdom literature. So when we look at the Hebrew Bible, we look at some of the books there, such as Proverbs, Job, Sirach, and you see a lot of this language um, and the imagery comes that, that John is, is referencing throughout the book of Revelation. You find similar type of writings in those, uh, those books that I just listed. So the focus of wisdom literature um, is all about you know, those larger universal truths, specifically the meaning of life and death and good and evil. So what we're looking at here is the capital that I talked to you about, which is Cora, capital city on the island of Patmos. And we see some ancient remains of a fortress. And this is the island where John was in prison. On the island today, there's also a very famous Byzantine library, which holds um, works of many of the monasteries and churches dating from many centuries. This is St. John's Cloister on the island. It was built in 1088, and is actually constructed over the site of John's Grotto. And so now, if you enter into that, um, that small chapel that I showed you, you can actually visit the sacred cave of the Apocalypse where the writings took place. So the Apocalypse is a book similar to other books that are Apocalypses, as I mentioned earlier. And one of those is also considered to be the book of Daniel. And it's, it holds a lot of resistance literature. And it's written um, to help people deal with moments of crises. It provides a message of hope and consolation. And it also challenges them to dare to believe. <coughs> so in summation... The Apocalypse literature does three things. One, it consoles people during times of persecution. Two, it provides an interpretation of historical events with a focus on justice and the sovereignty of God and the triumph of good over evil. And three, it persuades the audience to keep their covenant with God, to keep their contract with God and to be a part of his elect at the end of time. Be ready, be prepared, so you can join into that kingdom of God. Some of the key themes that we find throughout the book is that God is in control, and John's vision is related to, again, events that we find throughout the Hebrew Bible in terms of symbolism and reoccurring patterns that we find in history. So you'll see how he uses those, those events and brings them in and ties them into what we see happening in the book of Revelation. We're, another um, theme that we find is um, Jesus will return, the promise that Jesus will come again. And that, that final deliverance is going to take place, but after much distress. So we have the images of earthquakes and wars uh, and difficult times and fires a lot of things that have to do with nature. Um, and, but at, at the end, um, this new age that will come upon us will be because of God's intervention. Not anything that we mankind can do, but only because, again, God is in control. And evil and justice, um, evil will be judged and righteousness will be rewarded. 
So again, there will be a judgment. So don't despond, have faith. Again, that, that, that element of hope that runs throughout that book of, of, the, of Revelation. Salvation is for all who will receive it. So it's not based on race or nation, but it's inclusive. So John messages is to everyone, Gentiles, Jews, for, for anyone that will hear and accept um, Jesus Christ as Lord. So there's a lot of symbolism in the book of Revelation. Numbers have significance. So let's take a look at some of the numbers that we're going to see repeated over and over again throughout the book. So the number three, when you hear that number three, there's a lot of patterning with the number three. John tends to do things in threes. Um, it also uh, references few, limited number, or a limited amount of time. The number four is one of fullness, uh, and we think of something that's extensive. Uh, we think of the four corners of the universe, for example. Seven is a number of perfection. It shows orderliness, fullness, and completion. Ten is a number of limited, uh, of limited time or limited events. Twelve, again, is a number of completeness. And when we think of twelve, it references the twelve tribes of Israel. We could think of the twelve disciples. We can think of the twelve months in a year. So again, it's one of completeness. And when he references thousands, it means a number too large, too large to count, an, immense, an immensity. Continuing with symbols, now we take a look at colors. So John's visions are very graphic, and so there's a lot of descriptions in terms of colors, and what do those colors meet, mean? So we'll see Jesus dressed in shining white robes, or the one to come. Um, so you see these imageries of the angel. So white is um, a color of victory. Red is one of violence. Scarlet indicates bloodshed. When we think of purple, it's one of royalty. Black indicates famine, and pale green indicates death. So we'll see references to this when we begin to talk about the horses and their riders. Um, the imagery of Christ is always very graphic. He's uh, very powerful, one full of knowledge. Horns indicate power, and then eyes indicate knowledge, and it talks about um, his feet are like burning furnaces. So again, a lot of uh, very distinctive imagery. Why would you have that? Well, you think of the audience that John is writing to. It's, the majority would be illiterate. They don't have a printing press at this point in time. So again, the audience is very oral. So oral literature and listening to these stories and having an impact on you is what kind of images can you paint for the imagination? So again, there's a very specific uh, genre that writes to this, and how do you capture people's imagination and give them images that they're not going to quickly forget? And so he was very effective in drawing out these visual images um, that continue on to today. So opening with chapter one, the apocalypse. So the first word in the opening of the book of Apocalypse is actually that, apocalypsis, which means revelation. So that's where we get that title, Revelation, the gradual revealing. It starts and ends, the book, uh, this, uh, this book starts and ends actually as a letter. So we open with a greeting and we close with a farewell. But in between, it's not a letter. It's definitely um, something that John himself describes this work as a prophecy. And John will be the witness. He is, the purpose of his work is to witness for God and to also witness for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John clearly identifies himself as a servant of God. So you have this transmission chain that's taking place. So the God speaks to the angel, the angel speaks to John, and John now witnesses to the community of believers. And his audience, we know, is um, the seven churches that we find in Turkey. And he uses a pattern of three. And that pattern of three he's going to use throughout the book. So he talks about the role and function of Jesus in a pattern of three. So Jesus is a faithful witness. 
He is the firstborn to the dead, and he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And what are the activities of Jesus? Again, that pattern of three. Well, Jesus loves us. He freed us from sin. And he made us a kingdom and a priest of God. So if you have your Bible with you, we're going to look at chapter 1. And um, I'm going to highlight verses 4 through 8. And you can read along with me. So we're on chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. John, to the seven churches in Asia. Now remember, this is that opening letter. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins, by his blood, who has made us into a kingdom, priests for his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Now again, think about the graphic imagery in the next phrase, verse. Behold, he is coming amid the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the peoples of the earth will lament him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So the seven churches are actually located on a postal route, and they're approximately 50 miles apart. So we have Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And the postal route actually begins um, counterclockwise uh, to what the book does. So the book actually starts with the first church being Ephesus and goes clockwise through the listings. So we understand um, that the entire book of Revelation was sent to all seven churches. So it was read orally. It was shared among them. It would have gone quickly among the postal route. Uh, and of course... John, um, as a scribe, would have been able to have gotten this uh, copied and written over and over again uh, once it left Patmos uh, from these cities where these are fairly well-to-do cities where they would have had schools of scribes. Again, they would not have had um, printing press at this time, so the only way you could get your work out and about was by being in a location that you had access to schools of scribes that could copy and distribute your works. So let's stop a moment and think about the concept um, and the problem of theodosy. So what is the definition for theodosy? It's one of those theological terms, something that we don't use in our everyday vocabulary. And if I look at the definition from Merriam-Webster, it defines theodosy as the defense of God's goodness and omnipotence in view of the existence of evil. So in other words, how can there be evil in the world if there truly is a God of goodness and justice? Why would he allow it to exist? So what's John's? John has, of course, remember we talked about his pattern of three. He has a threefold response to this. And he's going to show how God deals with evil in the world. One, because God is sovereign. He's in control of everything. Two, um, he shows how Jesus, Jesus triumphed. Jesus triumphed over evil. Even though they crucified him, what happened? He resurrected. He triumphed over death and evil. Nothing could diminish or get rid of Christ because of that resurrection. And he shows to us that goodness will overcome evil, ultimately. And finally, as he shows us this, he provides us hope and consolation throughout this book, that even though Christians may be suffering persecution, or they may be coming into a point in time when they suffer persecution. They always have that hope and consolation and the promise of God's sovereignty and, and, and the evidence of Christ's uh, resurrection.
We move now into this incredible vision, the first vision that John has um, of this incredible, of this um, amazing heavenly being that comes before him. And everything takes place on the Lord's Day. So the Lord's Day is, is a term for the first day of the week named by Christians as the day Jesus arose from the dead. And hence, that's why we call it the Lord's Day, Sunday. So it's the first day that Christians actually meet and gather together um, as a community. And it's, they, it's intentionally separate from the Jewish Sabbath, which is Saturday. Again, they're separating themselves out from each other, separating themselves out. Just as the Jews didn't want anything to do with the Christians, the Christians are now making a concerted effort to be separate from the Jews. Okay, because the Jews didn't believe that Jesus was that Messiah. Again, the vision continues in this three-part pattern. So part of the Christian life, therefore, includes what they're experiencing, distress and possible persecution. Secondly, they're reminded about the kingdom and then the kingly reign of Jesus. And third, they're promised to, if they endure and, and be patient, um, they will make it to the end. So John is telling readers how Christians, as Christians, they're to respond to troubles precisely in a specific way because they are Christians. What is it they're called to do? Trumpets are used um, in cultic worship uh, as a way to announce different parts of either that are taking place in the worship or it's to call the people together to worship or a time of festivity um, and other public events. So the use of a trumpet again highlights something significant that is going to take place. The first command that John receives from this vision is to write down his visions, and he is to distribute them to those seven churches. Okay, so he, very specific instructions that he's receiving. And a scroll, um, and he's told you know, that he's to write it in a scroll. So a scroll is several pieces of parchment, parchment that are sewn together, and they're rolled on a spindle. So, so it's very clear instructions that John's giving, um, and he's detailed out his vision as, as what he's being told to do. Again, to add to the credibility of himself as a prophet and having received this prophecy. So we have three parts that are taking place in this message that he, he receives. Um, he has the vision, um, that one of hope and confidence in the, in the one Jesus who possesses this message um, with the power over the churches. So he receives a vision, he gives a response, and then he's also provided an interpretation. And in the, in the vision, there's an image of a seven-branch lampstand, and that's something that in the ancient Mediterranean world that audience would have recognized right away as the menorah and as a symbol of Israel and Judaism. The heavenly being is Christ, and we see the imagery of the feet and the eyes. We talked about that earlier. Um, again, knowledge and strength. And ancient people of the ancient world believe that power, um, the power to act upon things is found in your hands and feet. Again, that action. And that your will, your intellect, and your judgment are found in your eyes and your heart. In other words, your eyes reflect what is happening within your heart. When, we, when he's interpreting what the vision is that is being given to him, I, the, the being is telling him specifically what it is that the vision is, 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 represents. Um, the seven stars are the guardian spirits of the seven churches, which are the lamps. So the golden lamps represent the seven churches. The seven stars represent those guardian spirits. Again, in the ancient world, people believed that individuals were given guardian spirits and that cities also had guardian spirits that protected them. So again, the churches also have guardian spirits that protect them. And he hears this voice and the voice we're told is like water. And that indicates divine authority. In other words, the flow is unstoppable. There is nothing John can do to prevent this vision that is overwhelming and taking and dictating his life at this point in time. So we're on chapter 1. We're going to take a look at verses 19 through 20 in terms of the, the visual graphics and the orders that are given, being given to him from the vision. 
So chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. Write down, therefore, what you have seen and what is happening and what will happen afterwards. This is the secret meaning of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Right? So it's not like John's having to do any interpretation here. The vision is telling him exactly what it is that he's seeing and what it means. The language that's used is a reference uh, to the vision as being the Son of Man. Again, an emphasis on what we know as the huma, human nature um, of Jesus Christ. So we think of the human and divine. So the Son of Man, that emphasis again highlighting Jesus is both human and divine. It's also a name that no one would criticize um, versus saying, you know, I'm the Messiah or I'm God. Um, which would have raised, you know, strong objections from different groups, particularly the Jews, um, but they never objected to the reference to specifically the Son of Man. So maybe they'd listen to this with an open ear versus shutting off immediately. Uh, and he's dressed in a very specific uh, outfit, um, a very specific guard, um, and the reference is to the high priest. So the high priest in Judaism wears a full-length robe, very ornate, and here we have the vision, the Son of Man, dressed in brilliant white, a sign of victory, and he has a beautiful golden sash around his chest. And so now we have Jesus standing as the high priest, because when the temple fell, that entire priesthood disappeared. So you didn't have the Sadducees and the Pharisees. There was no cultic priest to maintain a temple that no longer existed. And now Jesus has replaced the high priest as the ultimate high priest, in this vision as the high priest of the kingdom of God. The sword is a symbol of divine judgment that he holds uh, there in, in that vision. And John, we see, is falling at his feet. And to fall at someone's feet is a sign of great respect and awe, to prostrate yourself. Uh, you see the strength of the right hand, and that represents the authority of a person. So the dominant hand tends to be the right hand, it was considered a sign of strength in the ancient world. And also the mention of the keys. So holding the keys indicated that that person, that individual had a, a position of great importance. And as we know, Jesus' victory over the cross results in him holding these powerful keys to the kingdom of God. So we're now on chapter 2, and we're going to now look at the seven letters that are being written to all seven churches, each one of the seven churches. And the letters, again, have a specific format. They're in three parts. And John keeps the image of Christ throughout very consistent, because and John's role is one of a scribe. So he writes down the words as dictated by Christ. So John is acting as a prophet of God, He's delivering these messages of consolation and warning. So the messages, again, are in three parts. Um, they'll be, first, they'll start with praise for that particular church community, that faith community. The second part would be a warning. And third is a promise. Okay. So the first church um, letter is to the church at Ephesus. And uh, he praises them because of their faithful endurance. Uh, against the different heresies that exist, because Ephesus, we're going to look at Ephesus in a moment here with much more detail, is a very large city with many different pagan and cultic groups. And within um, that early church, there are already heresies that are beginning to develop, different offshoots, different groups, which are causing problems for the early Christian community. There's a warning that comes to them in regards to um, uh, the heresies about the risen Christ and the knowledge of secret deeds. And so a very strong warning, particularly a against a group called the Nicolaitans. So the belief is, uh, a, a scholarly thread looks at the Nicolaitans 
um, that they were actually followers of Nicholas, who was one of the first seven deacons um, that was ordained in, by the apostles in the book of Acts. And these uh, Nicolaitans lead these lives that are very unrestrained and overly indulgent. Um, their teaching is, is, is very much um, not in alignment with what the early Christian church and the faith believed. Uh, and so they're somewhat, not somewhat, but they're definitely heretical and causing all sorts of tension and dissension among the Christian communities because they tend to be indifferent to adultery. Uh, they eat the food that has been sacrificed to idols. So the message that's being given to the church of Ephesus is warning them against following and, and th whatever it is that the Nicolaitans are teaching them to stay firm to their belief in the risen Christ um, and, and the knowledge of what it is that Christ can and does for them. And then they're promised um, if that once they stay firm, uh, and even if it leads to persecution, they will have a place in, in God's kingdom. They will take part of the tree of life. In other words, salvation and eternal life in God's kingdom. So Ephesus here is our first city. And it is a pro-counselor city in, ancient, um, in the ancient world. It's a commercial center. It's very large and it's located in that eastern section of um, the Roman uh, province. And a, as a pro-counselor city, it had a lot of benefits from the Roman Empire. So there are actually four of them, uh, and those four are within our seven churches. So again, very strong um, uh, commercial uh, and a lot of monetary benefits. Uh, that they get from the Romans because they create a lot of income for the Romans. It's the largest city in that pro pro provincial area in that, er um, that, we're, that it's located in. It had a population they estimate at about 250,000 during the first century alone. It was filled with pagan shrines and temples, a very famous temple uh, of Artemis there, the goddess of fertility. It also had a very large Jewish population. Paul spent two years there, um, we find in the book of Acts. Uh, the belief is that um, John took uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, there. And if you visit Ephesus, there's actually a shrine to, the, to Mary um, in Ephesus. There's a very large library. Uh, and again, um, different cults, including the imperial cults. So emperor worship was strong there. There was a temple that was dedicated to the emperor, they practiced magic, and the Nicolaitans were very um, were a significant uh, part of that community. So uh, again, that reference to them causing problems within that early Christian um, group. The reference that is made to paradise. Um, so when that term is used uh, in biblical writing, uh, it's actually a Persian word um, for a pleasure garden. So in Revelation, it symbolizes the Garden of Eden. It's a time when God restores that perfect fellowship that existed before sin entered the world. So when we go back to the book of Genesis and we see the beautiful writings about Adam and Eve strolling in the garden with God, being in community in perfect relationship, that's what the reference is to paradise. So we're promised paradise again in the kingdom of God um, but we have to be in a relationship with God and be ready for that second coming. Before you is uh, the Ephesus Library. So um, if you manage to get to Ephesus, it's considered one of those UNESCO heritage sites, so it's very well preserved. You can see how extensive and dramatic the library is. And of course, it's the, they have niches there for all these scrolls where the scrolls would have been kept. The city, as I mentioned earlier, was about a quarter of a million people. The theater here seats approximately 25,000 because it was such a large city. They actually have two theaters in Ephesus. This is the main one. And it's, um, they believe at this theater where Paul um, got into his dispute with the Silver Merchants Guild and would have had that argument there 
um, that we read about in the book of Acts. One of the many different uh, pagan temples that is located throughout Ephesus. So now we're moving on to the second church, and this is the church at Smyrna. Smyrna is, uh, again, a large um, commercial city. It has a very good um, harbor there, which is where its income is coming from. <clears throat> In the second century, it would run into many different um, positions of conflicts between Christians and non-Christians. The city also dealt with issues of poverty, the rich versus the poor. Um, we have the Bishop Polycarp, who was located in Smyrna, and he was actually martyred in 155, Common Era. So John's message to them is one of praise and encouragement. Because they are so challenged, they are a very poor community financially, but they're well-to-do in terms of, of their faith. So economically, they're struggling, but they're well-to-do um, they're strong in their faith. So he talks about a reference to a, a royal uh, a crown, and they need, by staying um, convicted to the very end and staying firm in their faith, they will be the ultimate winners, and they will, be, um, they will receive this crown. And so it's not a royal crown that he's referring to, but one that is garland or a wreath, such as would be worn by a winner at the, at the end of an athletic contest, for example. So part of the persecution, actually quite a significant part of the persecution for this small Christian community, was um, the Jewish synagogue in Samaria. There was a lot of interfighting that was happening between the Jews and the Christian Jews. So there was a, a different you know, persecution that was taking place from the Jewish community because they had, you know, distanced themselves from these Christian Jews. Christian Jews were still trying to convince them that, you know, accept Jesus as the Messiah. So a lot of conflict and tension taking place there. And that term of being faithful unto death meant to suffer martyrdom um, because of your faith as a Christian. So the promise is one of, um, of that eternal life. And also that all sinners would find would receive their final punishment. So those that are being so evil and creating so many problems for these early Christians would receive their punishment on that final day of judgment. So take a look at chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. So we're on chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write this. The first and the last who once died but came to life says this, that would be Jesus, I know your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those who claim to be Jews and are not, but rather are members of the assembly of Satan. Do not be afraid of anything that you are going to suffer. Indeed, the devil will throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will face an ordeal for ten days. Remain faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. So you notice that reference to Satan. Um, you'll see a lot of rhetoric that's used within uh, the ancient writings, Greek rhetoric. And so that reference, a lot of times they'll refer to, um, John will be writing about the Jews as Satan. or this, uh, And again, that, uh, that is very strong rhetoric, but it's very typical of the writing of that era. So the Christian community is challenged. It's very poor here in Smyrna. And again, that reference to a crown, it's um, not the crown of royalty that a king or an emperor would wear, but one that you would put on an athlete, one who makes it, who endures and makes it to the end of the race. Of the seven churches that John writes to, only two, Smyrna and Philadelphia, are blame-free. So note that only Smyrna, this one that we just talked about, and Philadelphia are the only ones that are blame-free. They haven't fallen um, into the trap of other cults. Um, you know, they've stayed firm in their faith and their belief to God and, and, and what the message um, of Jesus. And so they have stood uh, there all along with their covenant with God. And so John promises them a place in that eternal garden. 
not John, but Jesus who is transcribing to, um, to John. So Smyrna is located on the west coast of Asia Minor um, and it's north of Ephesus. It has an excellent harbor. It's a very large and busy commercial city in the first century. And today, um, it's, it, it, it's actually the famous city of Izmir in Turkey. It's still a very active uh, and dynamic city today. It's one of those four centers of provincial assembly in Asia Minor. So of the four um, that I talked about, we have all four of them in these seven churches. So Ephesus, Sardis, Pergamon, and Smyrna. So again, being a provincial assembly center brought you lots of kudos from the Romans. You had tax benefits um, because the Romans gained a lot of, of income and influence from those cities. They gave a lot of leeways to uh, individuals that were Roman citizens. It is the first um, uh, city to have built a temple to the goddess Roma, in other words, Rome. Uh, and it also um, had uh, a temple to Tiberius that dates back to um, the 26th um, year of the Common Era. And it's the second temple to be built to an emperor uh, after um, Pergamon. You, what you have here is a picture of the harbor in Smyrna. So, of course, you're looking at modern-day Izmir now um, and some of the rem remnants of the Byzantine uh, Empire. Here are some archaeological remains of what would have been the marketplace or the agora. Again, that use of rhetoric uh, in, in the book, uh, the letter to Smyrna, terms like the children of the devil. It's not anti-Semitic in the racial sense, but what it is expressing is the religious conflict that's taking place between Jews and that early Christian community. So it's important to understand that during the time of John, Jews are actually a minority in the Roman Empire. There's about 3 million Jews out of what they estimate to be approximately 60 million um, individuals in the Roman Empire. So Jews make up about 5% of that population. However, the Jewish community was at least 30% larger than the Christian community. So as a result, non-Christian Jews were somewhat resentful of Jewish Christians who were trying to maintain their identity within the Jewish synagogue because of that legal protection it provided them. Remember what I told you about emperor worship and how you had to once a year claim allegiance to the, um, that the Caesar was Lord, and the only ones who got exempted from that was Jews. So some of these Jewish Christians were trying to keep their foot in both doors so they wouldn't have to be called on to do that. And that created tension within the community um, and you know, hostility and resentment among those that were Christians who didn't have any Jewish background or ties and who were staying firm to the faith. And of course, the Jews of the synagogue um, were all about not accepting Jewish Christians and those Christians, and they were making it very difficult and turning them into the Roman government. So hence the reference to that synagogue being the synagogue of Satan, because they were traitors to their own people um, in, in one sense. So in reference to that garland wreath, so this is an example for example, after the Olympic Games, the type of crown that would be placed on the athlete. The church at Pergamon is a, a church. So Pergamon itself is a very famous city, an ancient city around from the 3rd century uh, before the Common Era. And it's a large commercial and religious center. And so John's message is one where uh, he, he shows that Christ has a double-edged sword here, indicating that there's some kind of judgment against that Christian community. So it's, his praise is, well, they've been standing strong against persecution, okay, uh, because it's, it's known as the city where the throne of Satan resides. So he's praising them for their strength against that persecution. But he also warns them that there are those in the community who are teaching compromise of the faith. 
and that it's okay to tolerate the teachings of those Nicolaitans again. Those that are, uh, one sense of the word is Balaam followers. And of course, Balaam references back to the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and what we read about in Kings 1 and 2 and the prophet Balaam. And he was one who supported a compromise with pagan cults. So Balaam is considered as one of those prototypes um, of religious compromise. And it's a very serious problem. So, you know, you have the temptation of heresies, you have the Nicolaitans, you have the pagan culture surrounding you. So, so John is giving them this warning. And the promise is that double-edged sword of Christ. In other words, there will be a judgment. You're going to receive a judgment. And, and at the end of that judgment, those who survive um, will receive this white stone. And that white stone, again, white is the sign of victory. So they'll have a new name, which indicates a new way of life and a new destiny. So here we are at Pergamon, where the throne of Satan is. And again, Pergamon is a very ancient city um, with a long history, established in the third century. It was the capital for a kingdom in Asia Minor, uh, an independent kingdom. And after the death of this, of this last king, Atalas III, he actually bequeathed the, the, his kingdom to the Romans. And so it became uh, a capital of the Roman province. Now, the name Pergamon uh, means citadel in Greek, and that's because of the location of the city. It's, it's way high up on a cliff on a hill. <clears throat> and the term um, Pergamos, Pergamon, uh, is where we get the word parchment from because the city was famous for making parchment. Again, it was a religious and cultural center. Its height made it, uh, s provided military security uh, to the area, uh, and it also, because it had such great views coming in from the harbor and also for some of the main uh, travel roads that led in and out of the city. Today, the town of Bergama uh, is below it, uh, so there is a, an active town. Um, within that area in Turkey. During the time of Augustus, Ephesus became uh, the capital. And, and later on, um, and it was the first to actually build a temple to um, the Emperor Augustus. So that was the beginning of the imperial cult. And that dates back to um, when we look at Augustus from 31 before the Common Era all the way to 14 um, Common Era. So very early on, um, we have that first original uh, temple that is built to an emperor and the start of that imperial cult. In uh, Pergamon, we find the sanctuary of Aselphius, and that's uh, the, the god of, of healing. And there's a very famous called Dr. Galen. He was supposed to have been born in Pergamon. Uh, and the symbol for uh, the god of healing is the one of the snake and the staff, which should be familiar to all of us because it's the symbol that's found in the medical community. There's a reference to Antipas, and Antipas was the first um, martyr uh, in Asia, first Christian martyr in, in Asia. And according to tradition, he was actually roasted to death in a bronze kettle during the reign of the Emperor Domitian. Um, and the Emperor Domitian was one who severely persecuted those early Christians. So throughout the, the city of Pergamon, you will find uh, many different deities that are worshipped with all these different temples, including one um, to the god Zeus. And that's the reference that we have to the throne of Satan. So this is a temple uh, to Trajan. And again, as I mentioned, um, the imperial cult. So w to build uh, a temple to an emperor was to receive um, high status from the Roman Empire, and you got a lot of benefits from it. Because when you're coming to worship at these temples, you're giving tithes and money and goods, which go back to uh, the, Roman, the, the center of the Roman Empire, Rome. This is a, a, a picture of the, of the theater in Pergamon. You can tell, can you see from this picture the incredible views that they have of the harbor and the city below and those main roads. 
And in reference to the throne of Satan, let's see. So here we have the altar of Zeus. So that's what we're talking about in terms of the throne of Satan. So you have the temple of Trajan, that's Caesar, the temple of Artemis, which I talked about earlier, who is the goddess of fer fertility. You have over here the temple of Dionysus, um, who is the goddess, the god of wine. Um, and then, of course, the altar of Zeus. So all in all, Pergamon is the throne of Satan, being all these deities, deities that, that are being worshipped. And that reference again to the white stone. Um, stones were frequently used as tokens of admission. So white being that symbol of victory is the promise that God, uh, Jesus would give to those that stay true to the faith, um, that suffered um, the consequences of their punishment and maintained their faith all the way through martyrdom. And they would be given that promised white stone so they had an entry into the kingdom of God. And they got to partake um, at the banquet table, that messianic banquet table where the Eucharist takes place. So the altar of Zeus, which um, this altar was actually located at Bergamon in Turkey, um, before countries um, took ownership, a lot of archaeological teams were used to go in and take lots of bits and pieces, and you find it all scattered throughout the world. Um, they the team, the archaeological team that went in and excavated uh, Bergamon um, actually removed the entire altar of Zeus, and it is now found in a famous museum in um, Berlin. And so uh, they left just the foundations at Bergamon. Of course, many countries now fight, sometimes successfully, going to these countries who have parts of their history trying to get them back. And, and we hear about it frequently in the news. Uh, even the local Getty has had to return sometimes things to these countries as they claim ownership. So uh, what, what many um, scholars think was taking place is that Pot in Potmos, where John was writing the book of Revelation, um, he would look, he could see this from that coastline. And the altar of Zeus uh, was very high up. Remember I showed you the cliff and the mountain and how extensive it was? And there would be fires lit in sacrifice and irreverence all the time continually in this altar. And so that's what he's looking at and claiming as the throne of Satan. Um, and of course, it does look like it in the shape of a throne. The, um, the altar itself measures 118 by 112 feet. Here we have the sanctuary of Aselphius um, at Pergamon. Um, and this was um, the famous medical uh, facility where Dr. Galen, uh, and the place where he was known for healing, he had a gift of healing and was able to cure. And so um, this specific sanctuary is another uh, place of healing where people would come from all around the world. And when excavators um, were working on the site, they would find frequently little images of hands or feet or eyes or ears or different body parts. And these were things that people would bring, praying for healing to take place. Or sometimes they would bring them in thankfulness for the healing that took place on that part of their body. Uh, and I don't know if you can see it here, but where all these people are walking, there's a way um, that leads you underground. And underground, there are all these little rooms. And um, the doctors would stand above and observe what was taking place in the little rooms because people who were possessed by demons would be put into these rooms and kept there. And so they thought that if they listened, they could hear what demon that they were speaking to and would be able to um, address their illness and maybe exercise that demon. Um, so it was um, one way that they dealt with illness in the ancient world. And of course, um, what you have before here is the rod of Aselphius. So Aselphius um, was the son of the god Apollo, and he was considered the walking healer. So the staff shows him walking, and the snake represents healing. So now we're at the church at Thyatira. And Thyatira is known for its trade guilds. And the image of Christ is, again, speaking to John in this vision. And um, it's a very specific image that we now have. Uh, Christ's eyes are fire, and his feet are shining um, very brightly. And that image is intentional because it contrasts with the sun god Helios, 
who has a large following in this city of Thyatira. So the community apparently um, is falling under the influence of a prophetess. So first of all, John praises them for their love of God, their holiness, and their faithfulness. But he warns them um, to stay strong against the influence um, of this prophetess who is deceiving them and leading them to idolatry. Very simple, similar to what the Nicolaitans doing. In other words, it's okay to worship the idols or eat the, the meat of the idols that's being offered to them um, to have adulterous relationships. Um, so what's happening is they're affecting the church so that it's um, part of the world and not standing outside of the world as they're called to be. So there's a, a warning that that prophetess will suffer punishment. Um, and disease is considered an appropriate punishment for sin uh, in the ancient world. And the language that's used, again, is very strong in terms of its rhetoric. Rhetoric, it talks about fornication and adultery, and it describes idol worship. So very much uh, metaphorical language, a lot of imagery that can take place in, in, in an individual's mind. And the promise is to the victors, um, that those that stay true and firm, that survive the judgment and persecutions that might take that will take place, um, will have authority over all the nations when they enter into the kingdom of God. So um, let's take a look at chapter two, verses eighteen through twenty, um, and we can get that imagery um, that he provides us of of Christ at the time. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write this: the Son of God whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet are like polished brass, says this, I know your works, your love, faith, service, and endurance, and that your last works are greater than the first. Yet, I hold this against you. So here's your warning, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. And again, that's a reference, that term Jezebel, you find in the Hebrew Bible, because there was a, a Jezebel who was married to an ancient Hebrew king in the northern kingdom who led the people astray, who brought them to idol worship. So she calls herself a prophetess who teaches and misleads my servants to play the harlot and to eat food sacrificed to idols. So here we are, Thyatira, uh, city of commerce. And this is where um, the Apostle Paul met Lydia here. So Thyatira is located in Western Asia. It was an ancient city dating back to the second century before the Common Era. Uh, today it's modern day Akhisar in Turkey. It was a military outpost for Pergamon. It had a very strategic location between two river valleys and, um, you know, on a very large highway. So it, you know, provided protection uh, and a heads up to Pergamon if there were any issues that were happening with invaders. It was an important center of making um, for trade and wool. Uh, it's mentioned in the book of Acts where we have Lydia who meets with the Apostle Paul as a merchant of purple dyes. It's a city known for its trade guilds. It had the most trade guilds of that area including coppersmiths, weavers, and dyers. And in that city, uh, in order to survive, if you did any kind of uh, commerce in the guilds, um, you, you had to be a member of a guild. And so as a result, many Christians were actually led to temptation and compromising the faith because at guild meetings, common meals were shared and they were dedicated to the patron of the deity of that particular guild. So again, uh, the warning is to stand strong and firm to your faith and not compromise um, being a church of the world versus outside of the world. And again, um, emperor worship was part of the city and that affected all the guilds. So here we have some remnants of Thyatira. So we're moving on to the church at Sardis. Again, Sardis is one of those cities of Roman provincial assembly, which tells us right away it's a rich city. It stands in favor with Rome. Uh, and it's a city where 
John has absolutely no praise for this for these for them. There's a large Jewish community, and the warning is to that they need to strengthen their faith, that they've become spiritually dead. They're they're not practicing their faith. They don't have that passion and drive. And his promise is that they will be judged, and those that survive the judgment will be victors. And in their victory, they're going to be um, their names will enter into that book of life, which means they'll have eternal life in the kingdom of God. So apparently what's taking place is the Christian community is getting fine, getting along with the Jewish community. There aren't any of the tensions that we've seen in some of these other early churches. Uh, and so they become very complacent, and they're just taking their faith for granted. Uh, so they're not going to be prepared when they do come up against opposition and they do face persecution, will they have the strength um, to dig down deep within themselves and stay strong against it? So he's warning them about taking everything too easily and complacent because he is warning of a time of persecution to come. And the com Christian community actually does suffer severe persecution in the second century. So here we are at Sardis. Sardis is, again, it's a city full of very sophisticated paganism, and that spiritual state of deadness uh, prevents them from realizing the power that can be found in belief in the resurrection of the living Christ. So the, it was once, once um, the capital of the ancient kingdom of Lydia. It's located in western Anatolia. Today, the city is uh, still in existence. It's called Sart Mustafa it's in Western Turkey. It has a very strategic location. Um, as it's located, it can view the central plain. Um, and it's also the, uh, a transition point for the Persian royal road. So you had a lot of commerce coming in and out of that city as people are moving toward the ports um, with, their, with their supplies. It's actually the first city which minted gold and silver coins under um, King Croesus, who was actually known for his great wealth, and he was the last king of Lydia, that empire under Lydia. Under the Roman Empire, uh, it became a very significant metropolitan area because of its location, and it was also a center of judicial administration. Uh, it's also in an earthquake zone, and the city has been um, suffered a lot of damage due to earthquakes to the point where it's had to be rebuilt several times. Uh, this is one of the Jewish sites. You can see from the mosaic remnants here that it was a very wealthy and large Jewish community, so a lot of activity there. Remnants of the Jewish synagogue. This one dates to the 3rd century Common Era. And here we find the temple to Artemis. Now, um, Artemis was the daughter of um, the god Zeus and Leto and was the twin of Apollo. And she's the goddess of the wilderness, the hunts, wild animals, and fertility. And she's known to help midwives as a goddess of birth. So a lot of worship of Artemis throughout the Roman Empire. So we've seen um, in every one of these major cities um, and these cities, uh, these seven churches, um, we have found these, these temples too dedicated to Artemis, the goddess of fertility. The church at Philadelphia, also known as the City of Brotherly Love, one of our Christian martyrs, uh, Polycarp, took place here in 155 in, during the Common Era. We have a reference, again, to falling to someone's feet, as, uh, and we know that that's an appropriate act of submission and awe and worship. And again, there's a reference to the synagogue of Satan, uh, and this would be to those unbelieving Jews and the problems that they're causing this community. So the praise here... Uh, to the church at Philadelphia is high praise, one of sharing and proclaiming the faith. So remember, John had nothing but praise for Smyrna and um, for Philadelphia. It's only these churches. So his warning is um, for these Christians to stay strong, um, 
despite the fact that they have very little power um, and they're being persecuted extensively by that Jewish community, uh, John assures them that there will come a day when they too will believe in the risen power of Christ. So the theme of evil and God um, is a promise that, again, that Theodosi, how God, the righteous God, will vindicate them and he'll make the wicked see their errors. So it's Philadelphia is where we're at, and Smyrna. These are the two churches that receive nothing but praise from, from John. So Philadelphia is a Lydian city. Um, it was founded by Attalus II, and he had this incredible devotion for his brother Eumenes, which is where that term um, derives from in terms of brotherly love. Uh, in current uh, times, Alishahir in Turkey is a city that now occupies that. Its location, again, is very strategic. It's on the high central plateau of Asia Minor, so it was a gateway into the Roman Empire. It's a city of great commercial importance. Uh, there's very little excavation that's been done at the site of itself. It's uh, a very fertile region in terms of agriculture, but it's also in an earthquake zone. So sometimes the earthquakes have been so severe that people will live outside of the city versus actually living inside the city. They have um, strong agriculture. As I mentioned earlier, um, they're known for um, their vineyards. And so there's a, a great, um, there was an extensive amount of worship to uh, the god Dionysus, um, the god of wine and fertility. They also have um, leathers and textiles, so a lot of export and import that was going on in that city. Here we have um, an example of St. John's Church, the remnants of it in uh, Philadelphia. And again, remember that reference to the synagogue of Satan is an attack not on all Jews, uh, but on those who had actually turned in Christians to the Roman government as not being true Jews. And again, that had to do with that imperial cult worship. And so those that would not make obeyance um, and fealty to the emperor could suffer persecution to the point of death. The church at Laodicea, uh, Laodicea is an ancient city, ancient city located on the Lycus River. It's a wealthy city. Uh, and in John's message, again, it's a city which receives no praise, um, and he warns them about their lukewarm faith. He talks about their spiritual poverty. They, are, they consider themselves the elite. They become complacent um, because they haven't had any issues of persecution, and everything has come to them easily. They're very comfortable in their riches um, because God has blessed them. So... Um, now, he's warned them, and he promises them, ah, you too will, will suffer the refining fi fires. And, but out of that, which is extensive persecution, you'll wear those gowns of victory. In other words, they'll be martyrs. They'll be dressed in gowns of white. Um, and those that suffer um, as martyrs uh, will be rewarded um, at, the, at the banquet table. They'll get to participate in the Eucharist of God, of Christ, um, and they'll sit uh, ne next to God on that banquet, um, at the banquet table um, by his throne. So again, um, a very strong um, warning and a promise of what to expect in terms of future persecution. So take a look at um, chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, Write this, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the source of God's creation, says this, I know your works. I know that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. So that's a pretty strong statement about what's going to take place. So here we are at Laodicea, the last of the seven churches, with a very strong warning. And again, on that postal route. And so the book, um, the, the book of Revelation goes to all seven of these churches, 
and it addresses all seven of the churches established by that Apostle Paul. So located on the Lycos River, um, the city is, dates, uh, is ancient, 7,500 years um, is what is thought, and it is the last church um, in the book of Revel in the series um, of Revelation. Uh, and it's located, um, as we said earlier, southwest of um, Philadelphia, uh, and it's very close to the city of Pamukkale, which is also known as White Cliffs or Hierapolis. Uh, and Pamukkale um, has a lot of effect on Laodicea. Today, the common name for um, Laodicea is, uh, the city close to it is Denizli in Turkey. Um, there's, uh, in terms of commerce, they uh, are textiles, they make clothing, uh, famous carpets. Um, they're known for their black wool. But they had a very serious problem with a lack of a reliable water system. So they um, used aqueducts to bring in their water from Hierapolis. And where Laodicea is, it can actually see Hierapolis because of the um, geography, these beautiful white cliffs due to the minerals. And so the water is piped from Hierapolis to Laodicea, but is very poor quality. And it's coming from the hot springs, so there's a lot of mineral builds up. It's also in an earthquake zone, suffered many um, earthquakes, and the city was actually eventually um, abandoned. Um, the closest area now to it is, as I mentioned, Denizli in Turkey. Uh, at Laodicea was a very famous medical school, which was known for its eye salve and ointment um, and its treatment of eye diseases. It was also a major banking location. So even though they suffered several earthquakes, they would rebuild themselves without any assistance from um, the Roman Empire. So here we have a picture of their Cardo Maximus um, in Laodicea, and that would be the main road that enters into the city, again indicating it was a wealthy um, area in terms of the Roman Empire because these kind of roads are definitely designed for um, processions of wealthy individuals or, or people of important of political importance as they come in and out. These are the remnants of the early church in Laodicea, as you can see, the baptistry here. And John's warning uh, to Laodiceas, he takes those three things that they value the most, um, that they take excessive pride in, their financial wealth, their extensive textile industry, and their famous eye ointment, and he turns it around on them in terms of the punishment and what they can what they can expect in their judgment. If you look at verse 318, um, he says very clearly, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments to put on so that your shameful nakedness may not be exposed, and by ointment to smear on your eyes so that you may see. So all those things that they took such pride in, he turns around and says, this will be part of your punishment and your judgment. And we'll use it differently so you come back into faith, um, true faith with God. So Hierapolis had a big impact on them because it was a resort. People would come there for the hot springs and waters. And this incredible whiteness that you see on the cliffs is because of those mineral deposits. But again, the water was such that... Um, it, it wasn't, it was lukewarm, uh, it was piped to Laodicea, and it was full of mineral deposits, so it wasn't very healthy, and it wasn't very consistent. Again, a very um, built-up uh, area there, so people would go to Hierapolis as a resort city, and as you can see, it, it, this incredible um, Roman theater, it's one of the best preserved ones, so we have a, a good idea of the art and architecture that went into it. Uh, overlooking, again, out to Laodicea, so merchants, a lot of commerce between the two cities. So some um, reflection questions uh, to consider on what we went through um, in this particular presentation. For John, seeing and hearing Christ immediately led to worship, as we see in his vision and how he responds. 
Today, we don't get to see and hear Christ as John did, but we are here to worship him. How can we see and hear Christ today? The second one is, how did living in an area where it was customary to worship Greek and Roman gods and the Roman emperor create a challenge for John's audience? What idols do Christians today worship that create similar challenges? So thank you very much for joining us today for this presentation um, on the book of Revelation. I look forward to you joining us for Unit 2. In Unit 2, we will be covering chapters 4 through 11, so hopefully you'll get an opportunity to read them before the class, but if not, you know, we'll be covering them during the presentation. I wish you each a very blessed day until we meet again. Please join me as we close in the prayer our Father taught us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.